Sounds like a cliffhanger to me. Well, the good news is, since I'm preaching Sunday night, instead of going three hours tonight, I'll only go an hour and a half. Memorial Day and Veterans Day are pastor's two favorite holidays, because that's the only time he gets to pull out his little Air Force picture with his hat and his ascot. <laughs> Amen. Revelation chapter number 17, turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 17. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about Mystery Babylon the Great, um, the Antichrist religion. Uh, you can pick any one of those titles you want tonight. Um, but Mystery Babylon the Great or Antichrist religion. Revelation chapter 17, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask tonight that it would be your words and your Holy Spirit, Lord, that it would not be my opinions but, Lord, what you want me to give to your people tonight. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would move through the auditorium tonight and throughout whoever views this online. Lord, I ask that when your word is open, that it would always touch and bless and educate someone more than it, it did before. Lord, I just ask, especially on a Wednesday night, normally we have time where we break into prayer, Lord. I'm sure there are many prayers that, that need to come before you. Many people have asked for prayer online. Lord, I can think of, of Tristan's grandpa, Joe, who's asked for prayer for Tommy, who uh, has been a friend of the family for years. Lord, I just ask that you would meet that need there. Lord, so many of us in here tonight, if we were honest, we would have a list a mile and a half long. Lord, I ask that you would reach and meet those needs tonight for each one of us, Lord. Help us to stay faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What I want to focus on tonight is the religion of the beast and Babylon. We've gone over and started to go through some of the seven heads and what are the attributes of these seven heads, which I believe are just a sign of everything the Antichrist will uh, embody as a world leader at the end. Those seven heads are, I believe, a combination of all uh, the worst uh, of the worst in leadership. Um, but tonight I want to switch gears just a little bit because I believe at this breaking point after talking about Nebuchadnezzar, who's the head of gold, who's, who's portrayed as the lion, who has the mouth speaking blasphemies, I feel like breaking off into the religion of the beast and the religion of the Antichrist, this is the most appropriate time because I believe the two kind of have to go hand in hand. I mean, most of the time you can control a people if you can control the religion right? I mean, the Roman Catholics did it for years, right? When they controlled the entire Roman Empire. Uh, matter of fact, that kind of broke stride when Napoleon Bonaventure put, took, the, took the crown from the last pope and he placed it on his own head. Before that time, all the popes were, or all the kings were crowned by the pope. And at this time, Napoleon basically says, hey, I'm going to crown myself. 
And that's when the Roman Catholic Church started to lose its overall dominance and power was one ruler going above it. Now, obviously, Napoleon, he ended up, his kingdom fell apart along with many others. But it's important to understand the religion, I believe, of the Antichrist. But in understanding the religion, we first need to understand how many people there are in the world. I found this to be very interesting. There right now, as according, uh, according to March 2020, they are now saying there are 7.8 billion people in the world. 7.8 billion. That's a lot of people. We've gone from 1 billion two year, 200 years ago to 7 billion. 200 years ago, there were 1 billion people. Now, 200 years later, there are 700 billion, or 7 billion, I'm sorry. I looked at the top, uh, at least the top two nations, because it broke down all of them by population. I just kind of wanted to get an idea here, because China has 1 billion, 438 million, 675,129 people. China does. It's a lot of people. India has 1 billion, 378 million, 367,851. Now, I went ahead at this point and th because of where I'm going to lead with this. The United States has approximately 330 million, 765,711 people. Now, obviously, this will be updated once all the census information comes back. This is pre-census. Uh, you know, everybody got their little census thing in the mail. So this is pre-census. But there's a few interesting things that I pulled up as I was looking at this. Six countries are projected to account for more than half the world's population growth, growth through the end of this century. Six countries are going to be attributed for the population growth. And I found this fascinating. Five of these countries are actually in Africa. Five of the six are in Africa. Hmm. It doesn't surprise me that someone like Bill Gates wants to send out sterile, as, I mean vaccinations, to the African people. No wonder they focused over there. Do you think he really is interested in saving them when he talks about population control? Do you really think he cares about them? Because if he cared about them, he'd send over planes full of food as they're starving to death tonight, to death. They actually bake certain types of dirt to make what's called a mud pie. You thought it was a joke growing up. They actually eat dirt because there are some minerals and nutritional elements that they can get out of eating dirt. Okay, Mr. Gates, you're doing a great job. You know, if you want to save them, why don't we just send them food? Why don't we send them some, something to eat? That's what they really need. But you know what? I'm going to list the top five religions of the world as well because these have a lot to do with population. Nineteen religions had at least one million members. Nineteen religions had one million, a minimum of one million, although there were many more than the nineteen. I'm going to start with the top five going backwards to forwards because this is really important. Number five on the list was Buddhism. Buddhism had 506 million members or people that is associated themselves with Zen Buddhism, that's 6% of the world's population. Number four was Hinduism, 1.1 billion, that attained for 14% of the world's population. Number three kind of shocked me. It's called secular, non-religious, agnostic, or atheist. They came in at 1.1 billion. 14% of the world. And if you were to look at the same charts and graphs that I was looking at uh, earlier today, you would see that it's mostly mostly like the nor nor uh, northern European countries like England, Finland, Sweden, Estonia, just different places. They're starting to lose their religion. Number two would probably surprise nobody. It's Islam at one9 billion members, which attained for 24% of the world's population. Now, that being said, the next religion really threw me for a loop. This religion just caught me completely off guard because there's 2.3 billion 
members, which attains for 29% of the world. Do you know what religion this one is? And it's going to shock you, but it's Christianity. And I'll tell you tonight, by looking out at the pews, I'll be darned to think that we have 2.3 billion members in Christianity tonight. Christianity boasts a 2.3 billion member group. But let me tell you something. I guarantee you there aren't 2.3 billion true Bible-believing saved Christians in the world today. Would you agree? 1.2 billion of them are Catholic, and it goes on down according to religions from there. Protestant was the next. And I had an interesting conversation with another guy that does property management with me, and he said something like, well, you know, I mean, if we're not Catholic, we're all Protestant. And I had to inform him. I said, I'm Baptist, and that's different. I said, being Baptist, I did not name myself a Baptist. I was named Baptist because we believe in baptizing some someone who actually believes the gospel, not baptized as a baby, as many religions do. We actually believe you actually has to have to trust Jesus Christ, and then we baptize. So Baptist, being called a Baptist, was actually a derogatory name, just like Christians were. They first called them Christians at Antioch. And most of the time, when you were calling them a Christ, someone a Christian, you didn't mean it in a good way. Oh, there goes an upstanding good citizen. There goes a guy who doesn't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, doesn't go out with women that do, and hey, let me tell you something, that guy's a good guy. No, it's the opposite. That Christian, that guy thinks that you're wrong, he's trying to teach you of a Jesus, and I hate him for it. And unfortunately, that's what's going on in the world today. So if there are 1.2 billion Catholics and 1.1 billion so-called Christians today, where are they? Where are they today? Because by sheer numbers, we should be ruling the world, right? And giving the gospel out to everyone. Remember when I gave you the statistics for the United States at 330 million? Did you realize that 229 million people claimed to be a Christian in 2016? Did you know that? 229 million in 2016 claimed to be Christian. If that truly were the case, America wouldn't be in the shape it is today. And these are all things you can pop off the internet. But let me tell you something. All this told me was one simple truth. The world is ready for the mother of harlots, the preacher of abominations, the Antichrist and his false prophet. The world is ripe. You know, the world's going to be ripe again when Jesus comes. And the angels are going to tell him the stick in his sickle for the harvest of the earth is ripe. But I'll tell you right now, wicked religion and so-called religions that claim to be Christian are destroying the world today. You know, I'll be honest with you. When we go out knocking doors, it's almost easier to talk to someone and lead them to Jesus Christ if they know nothing at all about religion. Do you know that? Most of the time, because then their religion doesn't get in their way. That doesn't stop them. They're usually ready. Their hearts are usually tender. They're not, they've not been programmed. They've not been told this is what you have to do. And if you go against it, you're going the wrong direction. You know, I, I believe, though, honestly, when it talks about the mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, I believe, according to what the Bible says, and I'm going to show you tonight, I believe it's something much worse than any of the ones I listed. I believe the coming apostate antichrist religion is going to be much, much worse than any religion. Too many people, we've thought too long that maybe Islam's the guy, that the antichrist is going to come out of there. Hey, let me tell you something. I believe it's going to be much worse than that. Trust me as we go through it. You know, I started thinking about these things after Jesus went and ascended up to heaven, Satan's had an awfully long time to prepare and plan for this final religion. He's had a long time. Just about 2,000 years. And I believe, too, the religion that's coming is what you would call a reprobate religion. 
and I'm going to explain why it's a reprobate religion. See, today, even though it's hard to win somebody to Christ that's of another faith, you can still do it. You can still knock the door of someone. You can still explain to a Muslim that they have a Jesus in their, in their Quran, and you can explain to who, to them who he really was, and they can actually see it. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims around the world are being saved tonight. You can talk to a Hindu, and you can lead them to Christ. You can talk to a Catholic that's steep, deep in idolatry, and you can lead them to Jesus Christ now. But there's coming a time when this reprobate religion is going to take the hearts of many of the people tonight. Now, I'm, I've labeled my one and maybe only point of burden of proof. How, Brother Aaron, how can you say that there's coming a religion that people will not be saved out of? Hey, if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again and you can be saved, you are blessed. And you'll see that tonight. What is the burden of proof? Turn to Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. The burden of proof. Verse number 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. The reason why I believe it's a new religion, something that we've never seen, is like the first beast, the Antichrist, comes out of the sea. He sits on many waters. Throughout the Bible, he's, he's come out of many different kingdoms, nations, and tongues. But this one's isolated, coming out of the earth. It's a little bit different. And the reason why I think that is because it's nothing like what we've ever seen before. I'll show you tonight from the Bible why I believe it's not going to be what so many have thought of for so many years. I actually kind of got scared really thinking about the gravity of what kind of religion is starting to come down the pike. It's a very wicked, blasphemous religion. It's become somewhat of a mystery, but I believe as time and, and things are starting to go together, it's starting to be able to show itself a little bit more and more. But I wanted to use a few Bible comparisons to show you why this is going to be a little bit different than anything you've ever seen. Verse number 12, And he exercises all power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, many could say that some of the major religious leaders, many of them worship them today. But let me tell you something. Almost every one of them, if he's not dead, will die. This guy is going to be different. He's, not, he's going to come back from the dead. That's the first thing that's going to make him different. That's the first thing. Whose deadly wound was healed. But here's the thing. Verse number 13, and he doth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Do you want to know why I believe this is so important? This first burden of proof is so important. I'm going to take a little bit from pastor's lesson or sermon the other night. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Because I believe the difference between the Antichrist and the false prophet and the religion they're going to propagate is they're going to be able to use everyone's book, Bible, or whatever to prove that they're God or that he's God. And you say, well, well how, how can that be? Turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. Because, see, Elijah got in a fight with some of the worshipers of Baal. He got in an argument with them, and basically he mocks them. He tells them, hey, call down to Baal, and if Baal brings fire, then worship him. And if the Lord brings fire, worship him. So for the sake of time, many of you heard that, or at least know it, I want to go back, and I want to go down to verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou has turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. 
And there's no greater deception if you're the Antichrist and the false prophet than to pull down fire from heaven. Because they can go to their King James Bible and they say, hey, you know what? You don't believe I'm God? Well, Baal couldn't pull down fire. That's the devil. But yet, I'm able to pull down fire from heaven. How do you not know that I'm God? I came back from the dead. You think it's Jesus Christ. You never saw him. But you see me. And fire just now came down from heaven. you never seen that before. You only heard about it in a book. And look what I've done. Look what I can do. Look what nobody else before me has done. Because I'm doing it all at once. Everybody else did it over a series of time. I'm doing it all at the same time. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And if your religion and your faith is based upon emotion and what you think it is, and it's not based on the, fact of the facts of the Word of God, everyone who doesn't believe that could be deceived by this. Why? Because I've never seen fire come down from heaven. Have you? Have you? A meteor, maybe? But to see what I believe would come down would be a great deception. So I believe one of the things that the Antichrist would use would be your Bible or a Bible. I believe that. He's a copycat. That's what the word Antichrist means. Another or in the place of. So I believe the Antichrist would use this book in starting his own new religion. Go back to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. Because I believe this religion is something we've never seen. This false religion that's going to take away a majority of this world in worship. If we don't get out and win people to Christ before this thing comes, they are going to have slim to no hope of being able to push off this deception. Because it will be too great. How can you argue with someone using your Bible if you were to sit there and say, hey, say I went up and I knocked doors this coming Saturday if we're allowed to go back out and knock. And I go knock doors and I knock on the door and I say, hey, did you ever hear the story about Elijah? They'd say, no, but did you see the guy on TV do it? Right? Because they'll say, well, how can you trust that book? It has contradictions. But seeing is believing, right? That's what they'd say. Verse number 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth. Now, he's trying to build up a religion, I believe, for a reason. And I just caught this the other day. That they, they, who? The people that are worshiping him. That they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Hmm. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You know, it's really important that you have a King James Bible because every word is important. Do you know how important the word they should make an image to the beast is? I'm going to show you how important they is. Turn to Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3. Because see, the first thing that someone who's an apostate Christian who only knew a little bit of Bible, a Roman Catholic, he may know that thou shalt not make any graven images, right? I mean, the third or second commandment, he should know that one, right? I mean, most people would, you know, be able to at least name some of the commandments and they know, oh, we shouldn't make an image or whatnot. So you say, well, well how's he going to hop, skip and jump around this one? Verse number 1 of Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold. See, the Antichrist could turn around and say, well, look, let's go back to Daniel chapter 3 where it says Nebuchadnezzar made the image. I'm not making the image. I'm God. These people know I'm God. They're making the image of me. I'm not. I'm not making a graven image. They are to worship me. 
And I think that's really important. Now, go down to verse number three. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors and the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providences were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then Herod cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. Hey, entire world, you better worship this image. That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go on any further because I want to get to my final point. But here's the thing. This Antichrist, this beast, this false prophet that's with him could say, look, hey, you think you know the Bible. Hey, I know you're not supposed to make a graven image, but we didn't do it. The people did it. Just like Aaron in the, in the wilderness when he collected all the gold and he told Moses, he, when Moses came down, he said, what'd you do? He said, all oh, the people, they just gave me all the stuff. I threw it in the fire and out came the image. Everybody's always looking for a scapegoat, right? And the Antichrist, who's a deceiver, is going to be looking for any way possible to deceive and pass the buck or blame to someone else. And that word they is really important because if there were some tribulation saint that came up to him and said, you're the Antichrist because you made the image, he could say, I am not because I didn't have anything to do with it. But because I'm God, they did it in worship of me. I believe that's another deception that he'll use. Now, turn back to Revelation chapter 13. I should have had you keep your place there. I'm sorry. Revelation 13, <clears throat> verse number 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, the famous 666. And you say, well, okay, brother Aaron, how can he dodge this one? Because in the book of Leviticus, it says not to put any mark on your body. That would be going against the Bible, brother Aaron. How could he get away with this? Let me tell you something. If you have the attributes of the Antichrist, you can get away with anything because it says you're not going to be able to buy or sell unless you have this mark. People are starving today. And I guarantee you there's many people around the world that would take a mark today if it got them a sandwich. I can guarantee you that because I talk to a lot of them on Facebook and so does my wife. We have a lot of people that we're in contact with that are on lockdown to the point to where they can't do anything. They can't do anything. They have to stay away from people. They can't make an honest day's wage. They can't even make a dishonest day's wage. They can't even get paid below minimum wage. That's how bad off it is for them. Do you think that there are many people around the world that would not take this mark at this point in human history? There's 7.8 billion people in the world, and there's billions that are starving to death today. You think they wouldn't take a mark? You think they wouldn't? You wouldn't even have to convince them from the Bible it's wrong. They just do it because they're hungry. Well, how do you get around that one? Turn to Ezekiel chapter number 9. Ezekiel chapter number 9, because I believe the Antichrist would turn here too, or the false prophet. Ezekiel chapter number 9. How do you get around a mark? Because it says you shouldn't put one anywhere. This is a really interesting chapter in the Bible. This is actually funny enough during the Babylonian captivity, ironically, at this time. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse number 1, the Bible reads, He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. 
And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen and with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old, young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men that were before the house. What is going on here? Guess what? The Antichrist could turn right here and say, hey, if you don't take my mark, you're worthy of death because I am God. That's what he'll say. We're going to get to that part in a minute. But let me tell you something. It looks here like you're supposed to take a mark, right? Or it's a good thing to have a mark. But I'll tell you this, at Revelation 13, it's not a good thing to have that mark. But the Antichrist could go right here and say, look, you're in my sanctuary. You're in my temple. And I'm saying you should take the mark. Because I'm God. And here's what the Bible says to back me up. Because it's okay for you to take a mark. And those who did not have the mark, what happened to them conveniently? They were killed. What happens to those who don't take the mark of the beast? They just let them go? They put them in a re-education camp? No, it's one and done. One and done. You know... Too many times people in, in unfortunately left behind series and all these books, they've made the Antichrist look like Joe Biden. Like he just can't get anything done right. Like uh, everybody's just tricking him and, and people are getting a mark behind his back and, and all this nonsense. But what's really happening is people are not realizing how serious this is. You think this Antichrist guy is going to be easily tricked? Do you think he's not going to have a system? That's going to nail down everyone in the world. You think he's just going to forget what he's supposed to say? Like Jojo? That's Joe Biden. That's our nickname for him, Jojo. Verse number 7, And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried, and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth it not. And the Antichrist could say, see, don't I see everything that's going on in the world today with the help of 5G, facial recognition scanners, contact tracing? He's not God, so he's got to have all the equipment to be able to spy on the world. But are you noticing how this beast system is starting to take hold in the world today? Next, you'll have uh, social engineering scores. Oh, wait, China does. And as for me also, my eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And you know what the Antichrist could say? Look, I've done it once before. I'll do it again. If you don't take the mark, I'll kill you, and I'm not going to have pity. You know, that leads to a whole other thing. The Bible says there are some that corrupt the word of God and handle it deceitfully. Do you realize that's why most false prophets are going to be damned to a devil's hell? Because they're corrupting the word of God. And they're handling it deceitfully. It doesn't say by accident they preached something that was maybe a little bit off. It says deceitfully. They corrupt. It's a dangerous thing to play with this book. You better be careful. You better be careful. You know, this false religion is going to make the Arab Spring look like 
an Easter egg hunt. Do you realize the Holocaust compared to what's going to happen here is going to look like a walk in the park compared to what the Antichrist is going to do at this time? Do you realize all the monstrosities that have ever taken place in the world are going to pale in comparison to what he does? And yet people just, no big deal. I'll trust Jesus later. Oh, you know, once later on when I see it happen, then I'll believe God. I'll turn to him then. No, today is the day of salvation. You better not wait. You better not wait. Brother Aaron, how do you know it's a reprobate religion? Turn back to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. I'm going to show you why it's a reprobate religion. I'm going to show you why that it is a, a new religion as well. Verse number, or Revelation 13, verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. They are going to worship him. Their names are not in the book of life. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I think if we all see this, maybe it might move us to do something since there's 2.3 billion of us in the world. As far as Christianity goes, right? Verse number 9. Verse number 9, nine of Second Thessalonians chapter 2 reads, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. What's that mean? They're not in the Lamb's book of life. And they're falling for this guy's deception. But guess what? It gets worse. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hey, if, if, if you're somebody who's caught up in a lot of sin and you're not saved, you better be careful. You can cross a line. Because you can love not the truth that you might be saved. Why? Because you have pleasure and unrighteousness. You're afraid to get that thing right with God. Be careful. Be careful. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Why is this going to be a new religion, Brother Aaron? I, I, why, why isn't he going to come from Islam? Why, why isn't he going to come from the apostate Catholic Church? Why isn't he a Hindu? Those have the largest numbers. Hey, Brother Aaron, why? Why isn't he one of those guys? Well, let's just see what the Bible has to say. Verse number 3 of Isaiah 14. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from thy hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Verse number 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we are? Aren't thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy voils. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Now, ironically, he's getting ready to go into who we're talking about. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Hmm. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? 
This is why it's going to be his religion and none of the others. Because he wants it to be his religion. He wants the worship. He wants it all. He doesn't want to share it with God Almighty. He wants to be who? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Jesus, get off your throne. It's mine. Because he's the Antichrist, another Christ. It's his religion. It's his false apostle. That's the mystery. Oh, all these other religions are wicked as hell. Oh, they make no mistake about that. It just makes it easier for when he shows up. That's all it does. All these religions point to when he arrives. I will ascend in the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The good news is, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. What's God say? Oh, you can bring your religion. People can wander and follow you. But at the end of the day, you're mine. And don't think for a minute that God gives the devil the keys to the car. He doesn't let the devil do anything unless he says you can do it. God's in ultimate control. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. Hey, the devil ain't going to let you go. Jesus is the one that lets you go. Amen. Quit holding on to that sin if it's keeping you from Jesus. Hey, Christian, if you're in something that's keeping you from sweet fellowship with Jesus, let it go. He's already opened the door. The devil wants to keep you there. There's nothing in this world worth dying for or separating your, uh, your, your relationship with Jesus for. Daniel chapter 11. I know I'm using a lot of Bible tonight, but I want to show you something. The mystery of this religion is himself. Daniel chapter 11, verse number 36. I got to hurry. I've only got a few minutes. And the king shall do according to his will, speaking of the Antichrist. And, she, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. Hey, Jesus wasn't Jesus. I'm Jesus. God isn't God. I'm God. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his father. Hey, you know what that tells me? There, that he's not going to regard any God of any kind. That's what that says to me. He's not going to regard any God of any kind. Nor the desire of women. Why? Because he's power mad. He's devil incarnate into this body at this time because he's come back from the de dead, indwelt by the de devil. Let me tell you something. He doesn't care because he only has a short time. Nor regard any God. Not the God of his fathers. Not the desire of women. No God. Not Allah. Not the gods of Hinduism. None of them. Why? For he shall magnify himself above all. All. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, a God in whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. The devil does not want to share worship with God at all. He wants to be God, and he wants your worship. Hey, Christian, get the sin out of your life, because... Indirectly, you're worshiping the devil by continuing in it. You're giving the devil his place when you just live in sin. You're giving him a throne in your life. Get rid of the throne in your life and get right with God. He wants you to worship him anyway. He'll take any worship. He doesn't want to share it with any other God. Because he thinks he is God. Luke chapter 10. Give me two minutes. Luke chapter 10. 
Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse number 18. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking now, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Not that you got power over everything, that they can't kill you. That doesn't mean you're going to go walk on scorpions and hold snakes. That's ridiculous. It has another meaning. I thought about teaching on that another time. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your name's in the Lamb's book of life, unlike Many of those who fall for the deception of this antichrist false religion whose names will not be in the book of life. I had a bunch more verses in Revelation talking about how they worship sorceries and witchcraft and they repent not as God's pouring out his judgment. The only way anyone ever repented not when God poured out judgments and they didn't get down on their hands and knees was when they became reprobate and they hardened their heart like Pharaoh. And they said, who is the Lord that I should obey? His voice. And that is what your loved ones get to look forward to if they don't get saved. We need to move and move quickly. I believe things like taking away our freedoms and our rights with this uh, coronavirus and all the lockdowns and all the things that are going on, they're slowly chipping away at our constitutional republic. They're slowly taking away our freedoms. I've, I mean... It, you know, I look at everything that's going on, and, and, and I know the numbers are, are, are staggering, right? Like a million people have it. I mean, but there's 330 million Americans, so, you know, at what cost? Oh, it could have been worse. Yeah, I mean, 99 point what percent survive it. I mean, you know, what are you, what are you willing to give up? You willing to let the devil chip away and set up his beast system at any cost? Look, I'd rather die knowing I fought what's coming down the road for my kids and grandkids. I'd rather die knowing that I stood up to something like that. I'll lay down my life for it knowing that they'll have one. As long as I stand up for it and say, you know what? I'll stand in front of it. Let, let it hit me so that they can live. Why? Because I love not my life unto death. I've, I, I, you know, I, it's not that I have a death wish. I'll die for Jesus, but I'll also live for him. And that's what we need to take in consideration. Every time we concede, every time we allow something to just get the best of us and fear set in, all we do is give place to the devil for him to take a little bit more. Every time. Every time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I... Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I ask that you continue to bless and meet our needs as a church. Lord, I know that there are many that are struggling. Lord, I know that they're on the fence with their resolve on what to do, what they shouldn't do. Lord, it just shows me that the devil's brainwashing is working. Lord, I ask that each one of us, every one of us who names the name of Jesus Christ and means it, not the 2.3 billion, more like probably the 100 or 200 million that truly do love you, that truly would stand up for what's right, for those who would give out the gospel and be strong. Lord, I ask that you strengthen our resolve and that you protect us and strengthen us and give us a will. Lord, I think we've had it too, go too good for too long, and I think many people have gotten afraid. Lord, strengthen them, lift them up, protect them. Help them to know they're not alone. That when you're involved and you're in it, they've got everything. Oh, when I think of all the Bible authors and, and characters that have, have done great feats and how they fought the devil and his demons and wickedness and how they've made stands because it was more important to side with you. 
it encourages me to do the same. Lord, strengthen us as a church. Strengthen the people. Help them not to harden their hearts. Help them not to get caught up in side issues and things that really don't matter. But to get in your word, give out the gospel, and draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.